Our first uh, new fellow for the evening is Professor Anne Kapling, Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Murdoch University. Anne is... Oh, okay, very good. Um, being very new to this secret society and not having anybody coming before me, I don't know quite how to calibrate this. So I'll just do what I was told, which is unusual, um, uh, which is to talk a little bit about my past research and where it's heading now. So I I'm an accidental Australian, as you can tell by the accent. Uh, I was actually doing my PhD in Canadian political history at University of Toronto when I met an Australian and ended up in Australia in 1985 after he had a winter in Canada. Um, it was really interesting to come to Australia in 1985 because uh, what I'd been working on in Toronto, I was really, really influenced by the work of um, a scholar named Harold Adams Innes, who was a non-Marxist political economist who wrote a number of books about how Canada's culture and political history and economy were decisively shaped by the exploitation of a successive series of raw commodities. And when I came to Australia in 1985, I thought, oh, I've come to a very similar country dealing with similar legacies, but in that time in a very different way. And I was really fortunate to be taken in by a group who took pity on me at the ANU um, I was pregnant, I was doing a PhD in another country, I was lonely and I was a historian, but the political scientist took me in and gave me a home. Uh, and it's there that I met Richard Higgett, who left very soon after to go to Manchester, but who deeply influenced my work to come. My, my work really um, began with a, a book with Brian Galligan on looking at the protective state and the dismantling of the protective state. And I was thinking a lot about that when Ross Garneau was launching the book earlier. And uh, that's very much of, of his time and his contribution. But it went on to go in a quite different direction. Um, to, and again, it was really influenced by a very strong group of outstanding scholars like Richard Higgett and Richard Lever and John Ravenhill to look at the history and the politics of Australia's engagement in a big international institution, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which most of you would know now as the World Trade Organization, from the end of the war to the, um, to the 1990s. And it was a, a kind of marvelous story of how um, great ideas and intellectual entrepreneurs in government can influence big international institutions where you're otherwise a quite a pipsqueak player. And that thought appealed to me very much, especially given the, the, the sort of um, economic difficulties that Australia labored under with its particular economic profile. Uh, and I think the big, the big finding out of that work was that small countries, not great powers, can shape international rules and the behavior of others. Uh, and what was amazing about that is that we did that largely in coalition with developing countries in our region, not with the United States, not with uh, the European powers. The logical follow-on from that work was to um, think we've got this marvelous institution where almost every country is a member, where collaboratively they deliberate and set rules for global trade, for the distribution of wealth, for the rules that affect the distribution of wealth, uh, and yet everyone's defected from it, and everybody is negotiating uh, bilateral, preferential, discriminatory trade agreements instead. How can we explain this phenomena? And so my more recent work was about looking at this. You know, econ economists like, like Ross Garneau are generally really critical of these kinds of trade arrangements because they are economically rational. Um, they divert trade, they discriminate, they don't create trade. Uh, businesses don't use them. Civil society organizations are critical of them. So why? And that led to some work on the Australia-US FTA, which um, I had the great pleasure of revisiting last month in an ASA-funded um, workshop. So that was my, my first taste of the, the academy. Uh, so I'm working on that and also on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which could be a return to multilateralism through the back door or could be very divisive. Then the, the last two things that I've been working on with um, WTO and ARC support are really about why 
um, really moving outside of the Australian purview and looking at um, the world more generally. And I, the first book funded by the ARC was on 10 metal income uh, countries, looking on why they negotiate FTAs that don't necessarily make a lot of economic sense. And that led to my current work, which I don't get a lot of time to work on these days, but I might get time to work on soon, on the future of the World Trade Organization. That organization, which was the kind of pinnacle of achievement, of, including of Australian diplomatic efforts, has been paralyzed and deadlocked for 12 years. Uh, there's all kinds of institutional fixes. There's all kinds of te great technocratic ideas. Why have none of them taken traction? So um, I've been researching in trade policy communities in all of the major WTO countries, including the new, the new developing country powers, talking to trade policy elites in government, business, civil society, saying, what do you understand this organization to be for? What do you see the problems as being? What, should it, what kind of problems should be, it be looking at? And what you find is a tremendous divide in understandings and expectations and a problem definition. So um, the technocrats don't have it this time. I think the political scientists have something to offer. So that, in a nutshell, uh, is a, a career. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, the last thing I did some work on was on corporate governance in Australian football clubs about 10 years ago with a colleague at Melbourne. It was a really interesting project because we were, we were trying to puzzle out through. Football clubs have a lot in common with universities. We create something together, which is knowledge and education, but we're also fierce competitors, um, soon even to be more so. We have players who are our academics. We have coaches who might be our, our, uh, our deans. We have... Um, CEOs like the Eddie Maguires of the world who are our vice chancellors and we have presidents and often that makes for very very difficult relationships and one of the things that we explored in that was the tensions between those corporate governance boards and the football club management and this is something that is kind of um, engaged me again recently and I think it'll be the next piece of work that I go back to in the context of universities so uh, Thanks. And thanks. <laughs>